is. This is Greg Soden. Plural marriage could possibly be one of the next sexual justice issues in the United States. After the legalization of interracial marriage and same-sex marriage in recent decades, advocates for plural marriage are making the case they deserve the same legal protections under the law. This discussion today is with religious studies scholar Philippa Meek from the University of Exeter. Meek is a doctoral fellow researching public perceptions versus the realities of plural marriage within fundamentalist Mormon communities. Our conversation gives a detailed overview of the court cases Loving v. Virginia, Obergefell v. Hodges, Lawrence v. Texas, and then discusses what possible path forward there is for legalization of plural marriage in the United States. We compare and contrast the public opinion polling in each case and then discuss the constantly changing opinion polling in the U.S. related to plural marriage. I had a blast recording this conversation with Philippa Meek. As always, if you like this show, you can subscribe and rate on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. You can find me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas or on Facebook at facebook.com slash classical ideas podcast. Philippa Meek is the author of the article From Loving to Obergefell and Beyond, Plural Marriage as the next sexual justice issue. Please enjoy my conversation with Philippa Meek. Philippa Meek, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Can you just spend a moment and introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit? So I'm currently um, currently doing a PhD. Uh, my focus is on polygamy within fundamentalist Mormon communities. Um, so I focus on what the public perceptions of Mormon polygamy are versus the realities and the lived experience of people who are actually practicing um, polygamy. Wonderful. I'm a little curious about your academic journey as well, because, you know, that's a very interesting thing to be interested in for research purposes. Tell me a little bit about your path leading you to that area of interest. So, in in, in fact, my undergraduate degree wasn't even in religious studies. It was in ancient history and Egyptology. Um, I did that in Swansea in South Wales. Um, And then I did... um, a graduate degree in religious studies at Durham University. And at that point, I was really interested in doing biblical archaeology. It quickly dawned on me when I did a master's in the U.S. at University of South Florida that I would need to learn quite a few languages in mm-hmm. order to do um, biblical archaeology. Um, but then I got really fascinated with new religious movements, and I took a class um, on Mormonism and just got really fascinated by it because I hadn't really learned a lot about the Mormon tradition or traditions, I should say, uh, before I came to the US. So after taking that class, I got really interested in the fundamentalist groups um, within, the, within the sort of Mormon umbrella. Um, and just that's when I delved into what my current research looks at. Do you have like a moment when you kind of realized that plural marriage within the FLDS community was sort of like captivating your attention and you realized you could spend a lot of time on it in research? Like, do you have like a, like a turning point, so to speak? I think that the, 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 the thing that me to it was because I saw a lot of the misconceptions, the stereotypes, the way people were perceiving plural marriage and assuming that there was just this, you know, that everyone was being abused, people were being forced into it, that there was a lot of um, sex abuse, uh, child abuse, underage brides. Um, And I just wanted to, you know, I I felt quite strongly about making sure that people's actual lived experience was accurately portrayed, because suddenly people are coming up with these stereotypes that are actually not a true reflection of what polygamy is for a lot of people. Um, 
I'm not a polygamist. I don't come from a Mormon tradition, but I still felt as if it was important to make sure that these people were heard. Um, a statistic that I quite frequently um, use is the fact that abuse within monogamous relationships is actually more prevalent than it is within polygamous ones for various reasons. So I felt it was important to um, use my work to get rid of a lot of the stereotypes and misconceptions and actually look at what the realities were. That's so responsible as well. And that's exactly what everybody should do. We know whenever you're coming across something that's new that you're unfamiliar with, giving it a fair shake and looking at actual real evidence and story is really the only fair way to go about it, isn't it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So we're here today to talk about a paper that you have coming out, I believe, very soon from Loving to, from Loving to Obergefell and Beyond Plural Marriage as the Next Sexual Justice Issue. So you have many papers available freely to download on your academia.edu page. Is this paper that we're going to talk about available quite yet? So I'm expecting it to come out any day now with the journal that is publishing. Um, I'm also going to be presenting a shorter version of this paper next week, in fact, at the Mormon History Association Conference in Salt Lake City. Um, so as soon as the, um, the, the, the version that is published through the journal comes out, I will be putting, it's going to be open access, so I'll be putting a version of that up on my academia.edu uh, site as soon as it's officially published. Brilliant. Okay. So for any listeners out there, by the time you hear this, you very well may, may be able to go and find that open access on Philippa's page. Fantastic. So I want to dive a little bit into the issue itself and talk about some court cases that we can use to set the stage. So there is a significant number of legal decisions that are definitive of sexual justice in the United States. And you do like this really fantastic breakdown of all of them in the paper building up to your argument, which I found so helpful because these are the cases that are cited often in what might be a future court battle over this issue. So let's start really quick with um, loving versus Virginia. Can you quickly summarize what listeners need to know about Loving, which is a very famous case, but it might be useful to talk about it for a moment anyway. So uh, Richard Loving and um, his wife, Mildred Jetta, uh, uh, fiance at the time, they were, he was a white man, she was a woman of color. They traveled to a state in which um, interracial marriage was legal married and then returned to Virginia where they lived um, and grew up as children and that's where they met and they established their marital home there. Authorities um, caught wind of this and decided to prosecute them because interracial marriage was illegal in Virginia at that time. Um, they took their fight all the way to the Supreme Court. They were supported by the American Civil Liberties Union um, and other organizations and the Supreme Court decided um, that, you know, that they, they, they ought to be, to, to be able to marry. Um, and they actually, the, the, the ruling states, and I quote, marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man, fundamental to our very existence and survival. And with that, it meant that interracial marriage was legalized throughout the United States in every single state. Um, and it also legalized interracial um, sex, which had previously been um, illegal in some um, in some states too. So it allowed couples of of different races to marry throughout the United States um, without the need to travel to different states um, where it was already legal. Something that's really interesting about that case as well is that public support for interracial marriage when this ruling came down was only 20% nationwide, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's so low. And your paper does this brilliant job of laying out the vast changes in opinion that can occur during court cases for sexual justice issues. Um, how did the opinion for interracial marriage change between the time it was legalized and today? So we know that it was 20% then. What is, how has it developed over time? Um, so it increased. Um, so in the year that they married, there was 4% of Americans polled approved of marriages between blacks and whites by 1968. So just over, so the year after the ruling, 
um, in Loving v. Virginia, 20% approved of the unions. Over time, that number has just cr increased year on year. And by you know, the 2013, 87% of, of Americans polled approved of, of marriages between blacks and whites. And what's interesting is when we look at the breakdown between uh, generations, we see that in, in, the, in this particular poll, between, people between the ages of uh, 18 and 29, there was a 96% approval rating, which is almost, you know, it's, it's almost a unanimous approval rating of, of people approving marriages between blacks and whites. And when we compare that to an older generation, so those of 65 and older, there was only 70% approval rating. Um, so what is really significant about this is that as the population ages, um, support for interracial marriage is, is, is almost universal within your generation. So we can only see that becoming more so across the board. Okay, great. So that's an awesome summary. Let's talk a little bit about Obergefell versus Hodges. Can you quickly summarize what listeners need to know about this case? So in, in, very, in very similar fashion to uh, the, the case of the Lovings, um, so James Obergefell and John Arthur, they lived together. They were a committed couple for over 20 years. Um, Arthur was diagnosed with ALS, and following the diagnosis, they decided that they wanted to get married. So they traveled to Maryland where same-sex marriage was legal. They were living in Ohio where it was not, they were not legally allowed to marry. Their marriage um, only lasted a few months, unfortunately, because Arthur died from his, um, in his Ill illness. But at that point, um, Obergefell discovered that because their marriage was not recognized in the state of Ohio, he could not be recognized as Arthur's surviving spouse and therefore wasn't entitled to the rights that a widow would otherwise have been entitled to had, them, had their marriage been between a heterosexual couple. So he decided to take a, 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 bring a suit against the state, arguing that it was unconstitutional. This actually ended up becoming a class action suit between other cases which were related from Ohio, Tennessee, Michigan, Kentucky, and they were all brought together and made their way to the Supreme Court, which resulted in another landmark ruling. And again, I quote, um, same-sex couples may exercise the fundamental right to marry in all states. Um, it said that the plaintiffs ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. So it was very clear that um, the Supreme Court, even though it, w it was actually a full majority, it wasn't a unanimous decision like the uh, case of Loving had been. So there were dissenting comments. Um, and one of the comments um, made was that the definition of marriage as union between two should, should have been a definition of um, a marriage between two people. Um, suggesting that the case could open the door for those seeking rights to plural marriage um, because it acknowledged that arguments used in the case of Ogrevel um, could actually be equally used in cases for plural marriage. That was such an interesting aspect of the article as well. Um, really quick, how did, how did public opinion change for same-sex marriage over the last several generations in a kind of like a similar way that it changed for loving? So again, we saw that um, in the days when, um, when same-sex marriage was first being asked in opinion polls, support for it was, was relatively low. Um, so in, for example, in 2001, uh, in a Pew Research poll, participants were asked if they approved of same-sex marriage and only 35% of respondents said that they did, with 57% opposed. Um, fast forward a few years and that actually, those figures kind of flip. Um, so by, let me just double check here. By 2004, only 37% of Americans were opposed to the move to legalize same-sex marriage compared to 59% who opposed legalizing same-sex marriage. So we have this sort of flip between those who were it and those who were opposed to it, um, just only in a few brief years. 
Um, and I think there was quite a jump in the years following um, Obergefell, which the, the Supreme Court decision happened in 2015, um, with, with, with the majority of Americans now supporting it, particularly among younger generations. Um, there was a study that came out around that time that said that about 10% of LGBT adults were married to someone of the same gender. Um, and the, that study suggested that with that 10%, that meant that a, a, the majority of Americans would know someone who is in a same-sex relationship or same-sex marriage. Um, and that likely attributed to changing views because th this study argued that if someone knows someone in a same-sex marriage, they're likely to know what the realities are. There's stereotypes that had previously been um, quite prolific. So yeah, we saw a massive change in support um, and especially, again, among younger generations. So the next sexual justice issue that we might be looking at, as you talk about in the paper, and as you just alluded to a moment ago, is the fight for legalization of plural marriage, of polygamy. And I found it so interesting that while I was reading your paper, that proponents of plural or polygamous marriage cite the Loving and Obergefell cases to argue possibly in their favor for plural marriage. So we talked about the statistics and the changing public support in those other two cases. How is the public support polling right now for plural marriage in the U.S. and if it's changing at all? So there have been, um, so a Gallup uh, longitudinal survey has asked the question for a number of years now about whether people, uh, so it, it asks a number of questions on issues of morality. So it talks about things like sex outside of marriage, um, people living together who aren't married, cohabitation, um, divorce, um, extramarital affairs, and so on. One of the questions it asks in that sort of morality study is about same-sex marriage. The, the 2008 data shows that 19% of people who were asked in the poll if they thought polygamy was a moral or was not a moral issue. So 19% of people actually said that polygamy was not a moral issue and, and therefore supported it. I was hoping that the 2019 data would have been published by now. I've been checking every day because they, <laughs> they do this annual survey at the beginning. It's between sort of the 10th of May every year. So I've been waiting for that, that data to be published. So any day now, um, the 2019 data will show, and I'm I'm very confident. I would stake money on it that the the numbers have increased. It might have only been increased by a couple of percentage points, but I believe that there will be an increase. Um, um, are, are are you going to post it on Twitter, like when the link comes out? Absolutely, yeah. And I'm hoping because I'm presenting a short version of this paper next week in Salt Lake City. I'm hoping that that 2019 data is there because when I present the paper, I can then present it with, with the fresh off the press 2019 data. Awesome. Um, okay, so real quick, a few basics. Uh, which groups practice plural marriage in North America? So the majority of people polygamy within um, North America are Muslims, um, and fundamentalist Mormons. Um, so we also have a, a number of minority groups. There are some Jewish groups that practice polygamy. There are some people who consider themselves Christian polygamists as well. And there are also um, a number of people who pr practice polygamy from a secular perspective. But um, the significant numbers are Muslims, and uh, fundamentalist Mormons. In fact, my understanding is that there are more Muslims who practice polygamy in the United States than fundamentalist Mormons. Oh, interesting. Okay, so real quick, a few little terminology breakdowns. Um, I find it pertinent to distinguish the difference between the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Why did this schism occur, and why is one opposed to plural marriage while the other is not? So the, uh, the mainstream LDS church uh, from uh, early in its days when it was founded in the uh, 19th century by Joseph Smith um, did start practicing polygamy. Uh, Joseph Smith and, and some of his closest followers took multiple wives. Um, Brigham Young, who 
was president of the church after the death of Joseph Smith, had you know dozens of wives and really sort of expanded the practice of polygamy within um, followers of the church. However, um, it, the, the church very quickly had a lot of opposition from the federal government who opposed um, the practice of plural marriage. They considered it to be barbaric. Um, in, in fact, at one point, the Republican Party um, considered polygamy one of the twin pillars of barbarism, the other being slavery. Um, so it was compared to um, the act of ritual sacrifice, the act of um, sati, which is um, widows burning themselves on their husband's funeral pyre um, because they would, you know, the, 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 the belief that they would be exalted from doing that. So it, polygamy was really painted very badly early on by the federal government and a number of laws were, were passed in order to try and curb the practice and put pressure on the Mormon church. That went on throughout the, uh, the 1800s um, and to the point where the federal government actually seized the, the assets of the church to put even more pressure on it. Uh, Utah was denied statehood a number of times as well. And this all led to um, the church making a statement which is known as the Manifesto in 1890, um, which publicly renounced me um, and, and told followers of the church to obey the laws of the land. So that was the public message. However, mm -hmm. privately, um, the, the message was somewhat different. Um, plural, plural marriage actually continued to be um, approved by the church um, and practiced somewhat surreptitiously into the 20th century. Um, the, the, the words in the manifesto of the law of the land um, people were interpreting that to say, okay, well, I can travel to a country where the laws are slightly different and have my plural marriage, um, you know, entered into there. So there was a lot of um, things going on behind the scenes um, until sort of early in the 20th century where there was more of a harder line. And then in, I think, the 1920s, the church started excommunicating um, members who continued to practice plural marriage. Um, it might be at this point that um, although poly polygamy is a gender neutral term so it can include plural marriage between one man and multiple wives or one woman and multiple husbands the way plural marriage is practiced by Mormon fundamentalists today is polygynously so with one man and multiple wives polyandry which is one wife and multiple husbands um, there are some um, examples of that occurring very early in the um, LDS church, but it's not something that's practiced today by, um, by Mormon polygamists. Um, so that really caused this break within the church. A number of groups broke away, believing that, um, that polygamy was, you know, a central tenet of the Mormon faith. Um, and then broke away. Um, there are a number of, um, groups, today, dozens in fact. Um, some of the largest groups include the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, the Centennial Park group, which actually broke away from, they, they had their own schism with the FLDS in the sort of 70s and 80s over a leadership dispute. Um, we also have um, the Apostolic United Brethren, also known as the Allred Group, um, and the Davis County Cooperative, also often referred to as the Kingston clan. And we also have groups down in Canada, uh, sorry, down in Mexico, uh, um, often referred to as the LeBaron group. They've gone through various different um, variations of names over time, again, depending on different leadership disputes. And there are lots of people who also practice polygamy as independent fundamentalist Mormons um, and don't really attribute their, their, their system assign themselves to any group in particular. Okay. Um, something that I'm, uh, I'm curious about that you said earlier is that there are secular plural marriage groups also. I mean, is this like, are there any like groups or is this like one-off families like just here and there scattered around? They tend to be one-off families. Um, you know, it might be people who decide they want to enter into a polygamous or polyamorous relationship, um, but they don't... Uh, you know, they don't state that they belong to any particular faith tradition. Um, 
it's also important to distinguish between polyamory and polygamy, whereas in polyamorous uh, secular groups, it could be one man, one woman, and another woman, and they're all equally having um, sexual relationships with, with each other, whereas in Mormon polygamy, it is very much dyadic between the husband and each of his wives. Um, occasionally, we do have secular groups come together as a community and practice um, polygamy, uh, you know, as, as a community um, group. Um, there are past examples. The, the Oneida community is one example that, it, that, that grew in the 19th century. But they tend to sort of come and last a generation or two and then, then, then disappear. Um, there aren't any groups that I'm aware of that are, are setting themselves up from a very secular perspective and building a community from that. Okay, gotcha. All right, so as I was reading the paper, another court case jumped out at me, which is Lawrence versus Texas. And so now that we've introduced plural marriage as a concept, I find Lawrence versus Texas to be super fascinating because that case invalidates anti-sodomy laws between two consenting adults. So how are pro-plural marriage advocates using Lawrence to argue in favor of plural marriage legalization? So they use this as an argument to say, you know, the, the, the government shouldn't be in our bedrooms. If two consenting adults are allowed to uh, practice sex in whatever way they, they, they wish, so long as they're consenting and as long as they're of, of, of the, above the age of consent, then the government really has no business getting involved in what we do. Um, so they've used that to argue that, you know, in, in polygamous relationships, just because one man has several wives and wants to have sexual relationships with each of his wives, the government shouldn't be policing that. They should be allowed to practice their sexual relationships in any way fit, so long as everyone is a consenting adult. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, too, when, whenever you think about it like that, like the policing of the bedroom. I mean, that seems like such a clear-cut issue for a person to decide on um, based on your own personal opinions. Are advocates of plural marriage voters? Like, do you know which way they vote in elections, whether it be state, local, or national elections? Um, I don't know a huge amount. I mean, there's, there's some things that I can comment on. Generally speaking, and this is very broad strokes here, um, they, uh, so, some uh, Mormons tend to be uh, conservative, but we do, especially amongst the, um, those who are um, advocating for plural marriage, we do have a lot of people who have been getting behind this or were getting behind this sort of same sex. Uh, fight as well. So they, they do come down on some sort of liberal aspects as well. So it's really hard to sort, I, I don't know of any specific data other than I know that uh, members of the LDS church do tend to be more conservative. Yeah, because um, that was really interesting because if I were to, you know, just hedge my, my bets and make a guess, I would say that they would probably vote conservative. But then the citing of these progressive legal decisions was really interesting to me. And I'm, I was just like really taken aback whenever I read that in your paper in like a really interesting way. I just found it super fascinating. Yeah, and it is, um, especially when you look at some fundamentalist groups who tend to be more conservative than others, where they do actually consider... Um, you know, same-sex relationships um, and intermarriage, interracial marriage as sinful. They have very um, specific views on race and, um, you know, sexuality as far as uh, homosexuality goes. So they do tend to be quite um, conservative um, in some respects, but they have found that by, by grouping together with people who are advocating for the right to uh, same-sex marriage, uh, for example, um, that they, you know, there's this kind of support in numbers, this, you know, the, 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 the number of people that they can get behind the cause, even if they don't fundamentally believe in or agree with their lifestyles, that they can all get together and fight for a common cause. Um, but it is worth, you know, it's important to note that amongst the people who are Mormons, who are practicing plural marriage, we have a whole spectrum of different political beliefs, beliefs on um, 
same sex marriage as well. You know, there is this whole spectrum that, that we can't go on all together into, you know, this, this, this same pile. For sure. And what's super cool is I bet a lot of people who are advocating for same sex marriage, or I mean, advocating for plural marriage, probably wound up changing their minds about the issue of same sex marriage as well. Like you probably have a lot of shifting opinions within both groups. Absolutely. And one of the things, especially when you, you come to some of the more um, conservative um, fundamentalist groups, particularly groups such as the FLDS, for example, um, which is probably one of the most famous groups because of Warren Jeffs and um, the abuse that he was instigating and taking part in within the, the FLDS community before he was um, prosecuted and is now in prison. Um, so there was a lot of press relating to that group. Um, they, you know, the, the, there was the, a very insular community. So they didn't really have much experience of the outside world, uh, outside of their faith tradition and the community that everyone was part of. So once they, you know, they, they interact with people who are of different faiths, um, of different races, they, their, their views do change. Um, and they do sort of see things uh, from a different perspective. So cool. The exposure to new ideas like just has this unbelievable power to break down walls. I just find that great. Um, something else that I found really interesting is that people who were against same-sex marriage legalization explicitly stated that they were afraid that legalization of same-sex marriage would open the door to plural marriage. You sort of mentioned that earlier. Can you say anything more about that? Because I found that to be really fascinating. So yeah, it was mentioned in, in dissenting comments in the Obergefell um, that, you know, that the arguments could be used, it could be equally applied to plural marriage. Um, so there were a lot of um, conservatives, especially evangelicals, actually, who were coming out and saying, you know, this is, this is just opening the floodgates. But one thing that, you know, we ought to remember is that these are people who have very, um, very strict understandings of what a traditional marriage should be. And it should be between one man and one woman. Um, and that they're, they're very reluctant or, in fact, um, refuse to accept that marriage should be anything outside of that um, traditional understanding of one man and one woman. So they see, you know, the legalization of same-sex marriage as opening the floodgates that, you know, anything will go. Um, and so my response to, to those people would be like, well, why should people not live the lives that they want to? Um, so long as everyone is a consenting adult and enters into that relationship of their own free will, why should we be policing how, you know, how people live their lives and, and, and how they want to marry? Um, and there's always going to be opposition. I don't think it, we're suddenly going to see this change between, um, you know, people, suddenly everyone is, is a supporter of, of plural marriage. But I think as the data shows with the support for interracial marriage and same-sex marriage, that over time support increases because suddenly people start seeing that you know, polygamists are just normal people. They have the same marital problems as everyone else. It's just multiplied hmm. <laughs> um, in, in some cases, but it's, you know, every, they're, they're normal people. There's nothing wrong with them. They're, you know, they're, they're not um, monsters or anything. And, and there are similar, you know, I, I'm reading things as a teenager that people would write about same sex couples and gay men were, were, you know, made out to be monsters and they, there was some horrible things said uh, which was simply not true and I think now that people realize that um, you know gay people are just as normal as everyone else there's no difference between someone who is heterosexual or homosexual it's you know the, the way that they they live their life is is up to them um, no one should be um, persecuted for their sexual orientation or the fact that they want to live a polygamous lifestyle. So speaking of policing, you said the word a minute ago, what are the cohabiting laws like in Utah versus other states? So states by state. So, so even though federal laws were passed in the 19th century, um, marriage, federal, uh, sorry, marriage laws are tend to be, um, uh, based on uh, state laws. So each state has their own way of 
policing marriage and m most of the time when people are prosecuted or have been prosecuted in the past for polygamy it's under bigamy statutes um so in the state of utah it is illegal um, you can be prosecuted under a bigamy statute just for cohabitating with more than one woman so in theory a man who lives with two women who are not his blood relations he could be considered to be cohabitating with those women and could be potentially open to prosecution. Um, that's a very strict interpretation of the law. There's also this interpretation of the, of, uh, sorry, there's also this um, clause written into the bigamy statute in Utah that just purporting to be married to more than one person opens you up to um, prosecution. So the majority of polygamists, Mormon polygamists in the United States practice plural marriage in a way that they have one legal marriage between usually the husband and the first wife and that affords all the legal protections that they would get from, from a legal marriage, tax breaks, inheritance rights, that sort of thing. Um, and then the additional marriages are spiritual only. They go through a religious ceremony um, that is specific to their faith tradition. So they aren't practicing plural marriage in a way that they have multiple marriage licenses, which is illegal and can be prosecuted. So this purports to be married um, clause within the Utah bigamy statute that a man who openly says, these are my three wives, opens himself for prosecution under that statute. Okay. Um, and so something else that was really interesting, I'm curious about when prosecution actually goes down because i know that when the law gets involved in these people's lives it tends to like blow up in their face right is that the case or like law enforcement like hesitant to step in because it can become like a public relations nightmare yeah so um there's a few elements of that so um first let me talk about uh the uh the raids so in 1953, um, in Short Creek, which is a FLDS community in, um, it's on the, it, the twin cities of Hilldale, Utah, and Colorado City, Arizona. So it, it sort of straddles the border. In 1953, there was a government raid um, in which women and children were taken away from their homes, men were arrested, and it became a public relations nightmare because um, there was very little evidence of abuse occurring. The children were, you know, well looked after. They were, you know, clean. They were, um, you know, polite. They were well behaved. They, there was no evidence of malnutrition, no evidence of mistreatment of the children. Um, so this is the kind of point in time where public opinion of, of polygamy started to shift, especially with how it was portrayed in the media. So the media was suddenly saying, you know, look at all of these families being torn apart for no reason. The women were separated from their children, but they weren't accused of any crimes. And then in a similar case in 2008, when there was a raid on the uh, Yearning for Zion Ranch in uh, El Dorado, Texas, which was a, another FLDS um, community, the same thing happened again where women were ripped away from you know in some cases they were nursing babies who would who who were um separated for them and, and the children were put into the state foster care system and again the women weren't accused of any crimes the the children looked well looked after um so there was this portrayal in the media of saying well why are we separating these families because of their religious practices and their religious beliefs um Ultimately, with the 2008 raid, it, 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 it transpired that it wasn't actually... So originally there was this phone call uh, which purported to be from someone who was within the ranch who was asking because she, she said that she'd been, abused, she was, she was, she, she'd been abused by her husband, she'd been raped and that she was pregnant um, and that she'd also had um, you know, underage... Um, she, she was forced into underage sex. So it turned out that that was actually, a, it was a prank call. It wasn't, it was actually a woman in Colorado making that call. It wasn't someone from within the community. Um, 
so again, it, th there was this baseless um, claim that that was supposed to come from the community itself, but then obviously this had legal implications because the police hadn't verified the call um, and you know that their standing on going into the ranch was therefore under dispute. And again, women and children were separated when the women weren't accused of any crimes. Um, and children actually, there's evidence to suggest that the children who were separated and went into the state care system had a lot more abuse than they had um, any, you know, ha had been open to whilst they were with their families. Um, so there's that element to it as well. And I just forgot the second part of my response mm -hmm. to that question. It's okay. Um, so if you, if you remember, let me know. Because, like, so busting stereotypes, and it, it, that's something that's one of my favorite parts of doing this show. And so to, like, you know, to reverse the stereotype that there's, like, tons of abuse, that these are, like, not well taken care of children, I think that's important for people to consider. And, you know, something that really struck me is when you were talking in the paper about how uh, public opinion can be lowered by outliers, right? Yeah. So you can talk about how, like, the AIDS epidemic lowered public support for same-sex marriage to its lowest historic levels in the 1980s. And then you have a figure like Warren Jeffs, who you talked about earlier, who does have a history of abuse. Does something like Jeffs, like an outlier from all the examples that you've been talking about, how much power does that have when considering public opinion? Um, a great amount. Um, so one thing that's interesting when we look at the data from Gallup about the, um, the issue of plural marriage is that there was a jump in support. Um, and so, you know, it depends on how you want to interpret the data. The way that I, I look at it and say, well, there, there is this, this is an indication here. So in 2010, the percentage of people who were polled in that Gallup survey who felt that polygamy was mor morally acceptable was at 7%. In 2011, after the first season of Sister Wives um, aired, uh, which is a fly on the wall sort of documentary of a family um, headed by Cody um, Brown, following them in their sort of life of, in plural marriage. Um, after the first season aired, that number jumped to 11%. So there was this 4% increase between the first season, between, before and after the first season of Sister Wives. So I, you know, interpret that as, you know, people are looking at this, they're seeing um, an, an example of plural marriage that they've never really been exposed to before. But then another thing that I feel is, was also indicative is that in the, um, the time around uh, when Jeffs was, um, he was on the FBI 10 most wanted list for a while, um, and then was later um, caught, the, the, there was a slight drop in support around the time that that happened. So I think there are outliers like Warren Jeffs, who was a horrific, I mean, he was a very evil man. I mean, he um, se sexually abused children and he was an accomplice to rape. He forced young girls to marry, um, you know, teenage girls to marry and did some really horrific things. Um, so people see that on the news and they, you know, then all of these horrible images of polygamy come up again. And it's the idea, oftentimes what happens is people see these images of people like Warren Jeffs, and then they believe that the abuse that he was, in, you know, responsible for is, you know, endemic amongst polygamous families. So it's not surprising to me that we saw a slight drop in support for polygamy um, around the time of Jeff's trial. You mentioned Sister Wives. Is the presence of pop culture helpful in general in changing public perception around this issue? Like, are there, are there any other examples that you can share? Yeah, so I think Sister Wives has done a lot of good um, because it does show, you know, a, you know, family with, you know, that have the same um, ups and downs as any marriage or any family might experience. Um, one thing um, that a lot of people had seen with the images of Jeffs was the FLDS, they wear quite conservative clothing. There's this, you know, unique style of dress that the women in particular wear that looks quite odd to people who've never really um, known, known a lot or experienced a lot about that 
that faith tradition. So they see women in these long hair with long hair and, and prairie dresses. And then there's this, you know, there, there are certain assumptions that go along with that. When we see Cody Brown and his family dressed, you know, as, uh, as you know, the, the rest of the American public might um, and living in a very similar lifestyle to a normal American family, um, people see that and say, well, you know what, they're just like the rest of us. The only thing is, is this guy has more than one wife. Um, and there are other examples as well. There are other documentary films that have been made. Um, other book, there have been books that the, 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 the Browns have published their own book. There's also Joe Darga, um, who's been quite outspoken as far as um, plural marriage rights go. Um, he and his wives live in Utah, and he actually ran for mayor um, in Harriman, Utah, a couple of years ago, and he dared the state to prosecute him because he knew that, and he knows that, um, the, the constitutionality of um, Reynolds v. The United States, which was the Supreme Court decision that um, ruled that polygamy was illegal. Um, the the constitu constitutionality of that court case is on shaky ground. So the likes of Joe Darger and Cody Brown have you know, made attempts to, um, well, the Browns actually brought a suit against um, Utah uh, and tried to, to take that to the Supreme Court. Um, but the, the Supreme Court um, declined to, to listen to their case. Um, but Joe Darga, for example, knows that if he was to be prosecuted under the bigamy statute, that there would be this constitutional, uh, you know, the challenge against the constitutional arguments. And th there's a high level of potential success there. Um, the, the, with the Browns, they brought a case um, following the first season of Sister Wives. Um, they realized they were under, um, under investigation by law um, and actually decided to leave the state and move to Nevada where the state laws are slightly different to that of Utah. So they didn't risk prosecution in, um, in Nevada, but they still took, they still brought their, their case. Um, and they, they decided that the, the courts decided that their, the case was actually moved to be because they'd moved out of, the, out of the state of Utah at the time. Um, but they did have some early success in having the uh, bigamy statute overturned um, before that case was, was overruled. Are you going to be watching um, the moves and the public statements about all those figures that you just mentioned as far as like future possible like court hearings? Absolutely, yeah. It's something that I'm, I'm always looking out for. Um, one thing that is worth noting is that... Um, Around the time of the, the, the suits that the, the Browns were involved in, um, the Attorney General for Utah at the time stated that he wouldn't prosecute practicing polygamists so long as there was no evidence of other crimes. Um, and it, indeed, in the last sort of 20 years, when there has been a crime against, a, uh, sorry, a, a case has been brought against a polygamist for polygamy under the bigamy statute in Utah, there have been other crimes present as well, such as, you know, social security benefit fraud or um, abuse of, of women or children. Okay. So, you know, near the end of your paper, a, a statistic that jumped out at me is that 19% of Americans supported interracial marriage when it was legalized in the Loving case which is about the same amount of public support for plural marriage today. Could you envision public support changing drastically if one of these cases does make it to the Supreme Court? I mean, I can speculate and I think, yes, it would. I think even just the press um, around such a case would lead people to learning more about plural marriage and understanding um, that, you know, Mormon polygamists are just like everyone else. It's just they choose to live a, a polygamous lifestyle. You know, um, real quick, is my, I think my theory is that like a lot of people probably are never asked their opinion on this issue and they've never really even thought about it. You know what I mean? I think that this is like not on the radar of most people because they've never really um, been polled because, I mean, I've never been polled in anything. Um, so, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's a lot of like unheard and undiscovered possibly being okay with this? 
Yeah, and even within um, the uh, mainstream LDS church, the statistics are surprising with the number of people who um, support the idea of plural marriage, um, despite the fact that it's against you know, the doctrine of the church. Um, so there was a, a very recent book that was published uh, by Jana Rees called The Next Mormons. And in that she um, includes data from um, the 2016 Next Mormon survey. And in that survey, she asked questions that had been previously asked in a Pew poll. Um, and she found that 69% of all current Latter-day Saints found that polygamy was morally wrong, which you know, suggests that we've got, you know, 30% of people who either don't have an opinion either way or think it's morally right. Um, and this compared to a Pew um, survey that occurred just five years earlier, which, um, six, sorry, 86% of Latter-day Saints um, were opposed to polygamy. So even just in five years, and we have to take, you know, that there has to be some caution when we look at this data because one survey was 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 taken out by poll by pew sorry and the other was the the next um the next mormon survey but the same question was asked um of people who were and in both cases it was people who were members of the mainstream lds church um but it is a significant change in view um uh, and in in that next mormon survey what was interesting again when we saw this with the um, the interracial marriage and same-sex marriage uh, data is that people in the younger generations tend to be more supportive than those in the um, older generations. Um, and that's reflected in the survey, which was just carried out in 2016. Amazing. What would you suggest interested listeners do to follow up on this discussion? Like where would you direct their attention if they want to know more, do some reading, et cetera? Uh, look at, you know, look at academic work that's been do it, been done on this. Um, there are a number of texts that have come out recently. There are journal articles too. Um, the next Mormon, the next Mormon's book is, is, is really accessible to people who are not really down for reading a really heavy academic text because it is, uh, it's more accessible than, than something that might be aimed at a classroom. Um, but also just do some research, look online and see, you know, what, what the, what the, um, the, 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 the sort of spectrum of people who practice plural marriage look like. Um, and also, you know, the, check out the documentary films that are out there and the TV shows. Um, obviously, each documentary or each show has its own spin. There's an element of producers, you know, sometimes scenes are set up for dramatic effect. Um, but, you know, people should look at all the different sides. There are shows out there that are against polygamy escaping polygamy is is one show one example you know look at all of the different sides and have people make their own judgments um but there's a lot of stuff out there um the tv show big love um as well which um i could have mentioned earlier with the statistics um people watching that the hbo show um there was a lot of support for polygamy that came off the back of that because suddenly it did sh the, the show does a very good job of showing the different ways in which polygamy has been and can be practiced. The, the, the main characters in the show, just like any other, other people, um, but it does show some of the darker elements as well. Um, and I think part of the reason why some abuse within some polygamous communities has been able to, to happen, so in the case of Warren Jeffs, is because polygamy is essentially illegal in the United States. And um, when, when, you know, people are trying to live away from the, 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 the authorities, it, this kind of gives this atmosphere where people don't feel that they can speak out if abuse is happening. So decriminalization and then legalization will help these people. Um, so, yeah. Well, Philip Amik, this has been like such a fascinating discussion and I'm so grateful to you for your like, objective explanations, your deep uh, use of statistics to show how this issue is related to other issues um, as far as sexual justice go in the United States. It's just so fascinating. Where can people find you if they want to follow your work in the future? 
So um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the um, interview, um, some of my work is available on the academia.edu website. Um, and also on, I'm on Twitter as well, um, at Philippa J. Meek. Um, and so I do post a lot of my uh, work on Twitter. I talk about my work on Twitter and I also um, publicize my upcoming conference presentations there too. Well, that's where I found you. So that's where everybody yeah. else can find you as well. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. This has been an awesome time. I'm so grateful to you for this hour today. I had a blast. Great. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk about my research. Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.